I believe God has something for you today. As a matter of fact, I believe in this whole series called Selah. That, that God wants to stir something and do something in your life. And so this is actually a series about the life of King David. Selah means pause, stop, reflect, drum solo. You know what I'm saying? Like it, if you're reading through the Psalms, and, and a lot of the Psalms will go this way. They will go, huh? You know, all my enemies hate me. Everybody's trying to kill me. God, where are you at? Selah, <laughs> you know? And, and, then, and then whoever's writing the psalm, and David wrote a lot of them, will come back and, and say, but God, you alone are my strength. Lord, you are my fortress. God, the bad guys are, are, are they're trying to kill me, but they're going to be in trouble, God, when you show up. And so this series, it's not about a walk through the psalms. It's actually about King David. Because most of his big moments... Most of his biggest struggles, his biggest challenges, his biggest victories, and his lowest points in life, he recorded the emotions through a song that we have in the Bible called Psalms. And many of those would go like that. Lord, my enemies hate me. The ungodly win the Big 12. While the righteous go to the Alamo Bowl. Selah. But you're still good. You know what I'm saying? So we're, we're going to look at some of the life and stories of, of David. And the coolest part about Selah, the coolest part about how those psalms progress, like David would unpack his frustration, David would unpack his abandonment, David would unpack how hard things were, and then he would say, Selah, sometimes God does his best work in the pause. Like God proves himself in the pause. God will solve the situation in the Selah. Oh, you're in the middle of of just waiting for God to move and in the quiet of the storm and it feels like everything's crashing in on around you. Selah. David was not, David is not a 21st century Christian like we view him as when we read his stories. And, you know, he's not. Matter of fact, David would probably be very uncomfortable in church today. David was rough. David was five generations removed from his great, 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 great grandfather being born into slavery. David was the second king of Israel, but the nation was still pretty rough. They'd been through ups and downs and ups and downs, and they were scattered here and about, and mixed and mingled, and among them was people that hated them, and mixed and mingled among them was people who would get a bigger army and kind of oppress them. And, and, and we kind of have this, this view of David, like he would be in church wearing a sports coat, good-looking guy, you know, that, that, that doesn't really fit David much at all. David probably wouldn't be uncomfortable in church today because when David worshipped, David danced, and when David danced, clothes started coming off. You know what I'm saying? Like, somebody keep Mr. Pastor Matt under wraps. You know what I'm saying? We don't need no David dancing. And, and David had kids. David had a lot of kids. Like, David was a nursery worker's nightmare. You know what's causing it, right, David? You know, so David doesn't necessarily fit 21st century North American. David was a warrior, Jesus, who came hundreds of years later, said, love your enemy. David killed so many of his enemies that God would not allow him to build the temple that he wanted to build. Paul, hundreds of years later, wrote, husbands, be, have one wife. David had seven that we know of, and the Bible mentions others. He could war, he could write, he could worship and one of the most famous lines about, about David was that he was a man after God's own heart. We're shocked by his sins, we're inspired by his victories, and we are moved by his worship. So if I could back up four generations before we get to the story of David where he comes on the scene, it was time for Moses to retire and Joshua was ready to lead the children of Israel who'd been in the wilderness for 40 years. And so Joshua and and the conquering armies of Israel go in, the angels of the Lord go before them, and and God says, listen, when you move into your promised land, when you move into the land that I'm giving you, there's going to be Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Georgia satellites, and all these people are going to be living there, and you need to push them out, you need to kill them, just don't let them stay. 
And Joshua and the army of Israel, they come in, and great battle after great battle, great victory after great victory. They soon vastly outnumber the people that are there, but they got tired in the battle. You ever get tired in the struggle? You ever get tired in the same day after day? Got to get up and got to go work and got to go battle for that paycheck and got to battle with them crazy kids and got to battle with the spouse. You ever just kind of get tired in the fighting and want to quit? That's exactly what happened to Joshua in his generation. I know somebody, I'm yelling already. I know somebody said, what does it matter? What difference does it make? We, there's more of us than there are them. Like, we've already defeated them. They serve us. What, what difference does it make if we, if we go ahead and, and finish? What, what does it matter? And they allowed some of those people that God said, push them out, kill them, whatever. They allowed some of them to stay because the nation of Israel got tired of fighting. Listen, some of you need to hear this. Don't get tired of fighting. Don't get tired of fighting. God's pushing and grinding, and he's clearing a path for you. And if you don't stop fighting, if you keep going at it, if you'll just keep going at it, he's getting rid of some stuff in your life that wants to sink you. Don't stop fighting. Amen? They got tired, and they gave up in the battle. And their children eventually intermarried with the people. God said, don't do that. It wasn't about the color of skin. It wasn't a racial thing. It was a spiritual thing. It was like, so, so their children intermarried with, with, with people that served pagan gods, and then the grandchildren grew up with the influence of those pagan religions. And Judges chapter 2, verse 10 says this, A generation arose that didn't even know the Lord. Because somebody got tired, and they stopped fighting. The people that we said, it's no big deal. The people we chose just to coexist with, they eventually got the upper hand. They eventually rebuilt their armies. They eventually oppressed Israel. And so God would, would see like the trouble his kids were in and, and some of them would pray, God, come back. God, do what you can do. Do it again. And so God would send a judge. And there's a whole book in the Bible that talks about this cycle, that, that Israel would be oppressed, they would give in to sin, they'd walk away from the Lord, and then their enemies would come and conquer them, and then God would send somebody like Gideon or someone like Deborah to lead them out. That's what the whole book of Judges is about. And this is the mistake that the nation of Israel made in that time of the nation of Judges or in, in the book of Judges. They would look at all of these other nations around them, and those nations were bigger, and those nations were stronger, and those nations had better armies and more powerful armies. And they were looking to the world around them, and they said, why don't we become like the world? Why don't we become like them? Listen, listen, listen. God wants more for you than what the world has to offer. God has something that's better for you than what the world has to offer. And when you start to do things the world's ways, you're saying no to the things of God. You, you can't be in bed with the things of the world and give birth to the things of God. And the nation of Israel, they got to looking at the world around them, and, and they're successful, and, and what they have is better, and what they have looks better. And so they started saying, you know what, they have a king. We want a king. God's like, mm, you don't want a king. No, no, we want a king. They have a king. Their army's better. We want a king. Come on. We, you know, like God's like, you don't want a king. Because if you have a king, he is going to make your sons serve in his army. And he is going to require that your daughters be his concubines. I'm telling you right now, you don't want a king. Just because the things of the world look better and enticing, God has something better for you. We want a king. We want a king. And so God gave them what they wanted. God gave them a king that they would have picked. And he makes a guy by the name of Saul king. And the Bible says that Saul was kind of a tall, carried himself well. Now, at the beginning of Saul's story, he's, he's a little bit apprehensive. But what we learn about him is he gets more comfortable in his role. And as he steps into leading the nation of Israel, he's really impatient and he's a little bit arrogant, and those two qualities are actually what cost him his crown. 
because he got impatient and he was arrogant, thought he could do it his own way, and he got tired of waiting on the Lord. And so he actually disobeyed the man of God, the prophet Samuel. said, listen, I want you to go here and just wait. We don't like waiting, do we? Sometimes God says, I want you to go here and just wait. And Saul got there, and he got tired of waiting. Fear kind of crept in. People were, his army was leaving, and, and he took matters into his own hands. He was arrogant. I can do it by myself. And he sacrifices the whole altar sacrifice thing there by himself. And Samuel shows up just as that happened. He's like, what'd you do? And God looks down and he says, listen, if this is how it's going to be, if you're going to be arrogant, if you're going to be impatient, if you can't wait upon the Lord, I'm going to pick somebody who will. And that's where a young man by the name of David comes on the, king, or comes on the scene. Saul is still king, but God anoints David to be the next king. And that's where our story picks up today. 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you've got your Bible, you can follow along. We'll have it up on the screen and, like, I want to read, I want to let the Bible tell the story. Is it okay if I just read several verses here? Like, we're doing churchy things today. Can we, can we read the Bible? All right, so here we go. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? Like, Saul, something ain't right between the ears. You know what I'm saying? Like, if he hears of this, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord said, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which one of his sons to anoint for me. Verse 4. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. Like, it wasn't good when Samuel came to town. You know, like, is he coming to bring judgment? Is he coming to call fire down on us? Like, he was a man of God. He could hear from God, and, and the elders are all, all, what's wrong? That's the first thing they say. What's wrong? Do you come in peace? Yes, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves. And come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite. Watch this right here. This is important. For Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. Did you catch that? For Jesse and his sons. Verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel took one and looked at Eliab. And he thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Because the last time God picked a king, it was a guy like Eliab. It was a guy that was big and tall and strong and mature and ready. And that kind of king would have been what the people wanted. The people would have loved Eliab to be their next king. The people would have asked for that, but that kind of king didn't work. So God said, this time, I'm going to pick what you would least expect. I'm going to pick a kid that nobody else would pick. I'm going to do something that nobody would expect. Verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's so powerful. That's so powerful. Some of you in here, you're so concerned about how you look, and God don't care. He's concerned with what's your inside. He's, inser he's concerned with your spiritual He's concerned with what's going on on the inside. Verse 8, then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. All right, next. Eliab didn't cut. Come on, surely it's Abinadab. I mean, I get it. The oldest child thinks they're smarter and better than everybody else. I know. Come on, the babies of the family are the best. Can I get an amen? All right, there we are. So next, Jesse summoned. Um, then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Verse 9, next. Jesse summoned Shemiah, but, but Samuel said, no, neither is this one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel said, like, are you sure? Are these all of the, is this all the sons that you have? Well, there's... Still the youngest, Jesse replied. Notice here, Jesse didn't even call him by name. He didn't say there's still David. Abinadab, come here. Eliab, come here. But when he's talking to Samuel, he didn't say, well, there's still David. He just said, well, there's, there's the youngest. That's what he'd been labeled. 
Jesse didn't bother to send for him because he didn't think it would matter. Verse 5, I asked you to remember that just a second ago. It said, and when Samuel said, Jesse, go get all of your sons, he didn't even bother with David. David hadn't even been through the purification rite like the other seven brothers had. So I, I just, like I like to play with stories a little bit. Like picture dinner time at David's house. He, he's the youngest that we know of at this point because scripture says that. And like they're there having the meal and, and, it's, and it's time to come in. And, and so David's been out in the back 40 with all the sheep and he smells like sheep and he's doing this outside the door because mama don't want that on the rug, you know what I'm saying? And like Eliab and Shemiah, they have been all at the army, you know, and they're coming in and they're walking proud and they're talking loud and they're drawing a crowd. And what'd y'all do in special forces training this weekend? They're, you're like, like, hey. And so they're sitting down. The boys get to come home for the weekend and, and David comes in, kind of the run of the family, you know, and they're sitting there. And, and Jesse, the father, kind of speaks up and goes, well, David, how was the flock today? And David, you know, the little man's like, oh, dad, you know, it was okay. It got a whole lot better after I killed the bear. And you know Eliab's going, you kill the bear. The facial expressions, you kill the bear. Did you, like, did you use a 12 gauge? I mean, what'd you use? You use 30 out six? No, I killed him with my hand. Oh, oh. <laughs> you killed him with your hand. And so Jesse's sitting at the, you like to play with the stories too, don't you? Jesse's sitting there at the end of the table and he's like, I don't want to squelch this David's creative enthusiasm, but I also want him to see reality. So you, 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 you Kill, you killed a bear today. Yeah, yeah. Was, was it difficult? No, nah, it, it wasn't near as hard as killing the lion. <laughs> so all the seven brothers like, ah, this day they can no longer contain it. They're laughing. They're beating the table. Ah, David the lion killer. You know, this is all going on. And David's like, yeah, it's all real. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. And so just imagine all of this goes flashing through Jesse's head. When the prophet says, is this all of your sons? Oh. Deep breath. Well, they're still the youngest. You got to understand, he's really young, though. He's very imaginative. So go, Elisha, go get David. And so parents have a way of doing this. Like when David comes up on the scene, because he can hear the commotion, he knows. And like, he's kind of peeking over the hills anyway, trying to check out what's going on. And so when, when David shows up on the scene, Jesse walks to meet him. And Jesse has that smile. That's communicating something. Boy, you know what I'm saying? And he's like, he's smiling. Hey, Samuel. And he like talks without moving his lips. And he's like, there's a really, 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 really important man here. Don't talk. No lions, tigers, and bears today. You let the really, really, really important man talk and you just smile and wave. All right? You don't say nothing. Verse 11, they're still the youngest, but he's out in the field watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once. So I, I read this, Samuel's frustrated because he told Jesse, get your boys. And Jesse thought the youngest didn't matter. We're not gonna sit down until he gets here. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome and looked a lot like me with beautiful eyes. And the, I'm sorry. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil and he anointed David with the oil and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. I love that. He stepped into his calling and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him from that day on and Samuel returned to Ramah. Last time, God picked Saul, who would have pleased the people. He was ready. He was mature. He was tall. He was strong. He was big. Saul was a king that the, man would have, the, the people would have voted in. I vote for Saul. This time, God gave the task to somebody who was not ready. So David has just been anointed king. And he sits down and he captures the emotions of this moment in a song. And, and, and a lot of scholars believe that Psalm not, uh, 39 is actually happens right after Samuel had just anointed him with oil to be the next king. 
And so when you look into and you read Psalm 39 from that context, you're like, yeah, that makes a little bit of sense. The calling has happened, but the crowning has not. What do you do when you've been called, but you're not ready? What do you do when God calls you up, but you're not equipped? What do you do when God gives you a dream, but you're in the middle of a delay? 38 years of delay for David. You see your purpose, but God has you in the pause. This is how David reflects on what just happened with the anointing of oil and being named king, and and he writes all of this emotional story into a song. So I want to turn to Psalm chapter 39, verse 1. Just going to look at a couple of verses here. I said to myself, like this is internal dialogue, okay? I will watch what I do and not sin in what I do say i will hold my tongue when the ungodly are around me but as i stood there in silence not even speaking of good things the turmoil with the turmoil within me grew worse like i think he's doing what dad told him shut up don't you say nothing you let samuel talk you don't say anything and so i'm like okay i'm not gonna say anything but as he gets there all of a sudden this is a cool moment but then he's also struck with frustration there's also this turmoil that's building on the inside of him and it grew worse verse three The more I thought about it, the hotter I got igniting a fire of words. I'm the king now. I'm the anointed king now. I can't be that crazy kid telling wild but true stories. I'm called, but I'm not equipped. What am I going to do? And so David writes this song to remind himself, yesterday my life had a purpose. I was watching sheep. But today, God did something different. When God shows up, that changes everything. Yesterday, I had a purpose, but today, I've got a destiny. David knew what Paul would record hundreds of years later in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. This is Paul writing. He says, therefore, I, a prisoner, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your, everybody say it with me, calling. For you have been called by God. Paul's not writing to seminary students. Okay, freshman. He's not. He's not talking to a room of hopeful missionaries that someday want to move to Uganda or the Ukraine. He's writing to Christians that make up the church in Ephesus. He's writing to you, teenagers. He's talking to you. I beg you, live a life worthy of the calling. For you have been called, every one of us have been called by God for a destiny and a purpose. Little, you don't, preacher, you don't, little old me, I just go work my 40 hours a week and I come home and I raise my kid. You've been called. You have a purpose and a destiny and a design that God put into your life. And when God shows up, he saves you because he's a good God and because he loves you. But when God saves you, he saves you for his purpose. Yesterday, I was just an unnamed, forgotten, labeled as the youngest in the back pasture watching sheep, wasn't even invited to the prophet's party kid. But today, I'm carrying the high calling of God on my life. Man, I'm just going to wait till that excites somebody. Because yesterday, you were just living in the mundane. But today, God shows up and he wants to pour out his anointing oil on your head. Do you know why the church has kind of lost some of its power? See, I, I grew up, and, and, and we went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Sunday morning church, like two and a half hours. You're welcome. We don't do that. The church has lost some of its power, and we've lost some of our just kind of desire and, and kind of our drive. is because we just want just enough of God so the kids won't turn out crazy. We want just enough of God that, that I, can, I can keep the lines open so that when Mamma dies, I can pray and like he'll hear me. But I'm telling you, church, I'm telling you, dad, I'm telling you, husband, I'm telling you, wife, there is a whole nother level of anointing that God wants to pour out in your calling and in your life. But you've got to, yeah, come on, give him praise. Y'all going to be that church today, all right? All right, the hanky's coming out. 
Get ready, get them. He has a calling for you. And he wants to pour out his anointing and his oil. But you got to make a decision right there where you're at. Am I good being comfortable and convenient Christian? Or do I want to step in and be called Christian? I'm not sending you off to the Ukraine tomorrow. I'm sending you into your workplace. Teenagers, we're not taking you on a mission trip tomorrow. We're sending you to a mission field called your school. And you got to be willing to say, I've done this. I've been this. God was kind of there conveniently when I needed him. And you know what? That's okay. It's a little bit frustrating sometimes, but I'm ready. I'm ready to step into the calling. I'm ready to step into the destiny that God has for me. And if that's where you're at today, God's going to push you. He's going to pull you and he's going to mature you. Amen, everybody. Get back to my notes. That was all free. David in the inside of his head is having this internal dialogue. All right, David. They just soaked you with oil after you go take a shower. Because that's, I don't know if you've ever, it's crazy. But like, just be cool. Just be cool, David. You got to walk with swag now. You know what I'm saying? Just, just be cool. Don't say anything stupid. Don't, just, just watch what you say. You're a king now. You don't have to tell wild stories to impress anybody. You, you, you're, you're the king. You, you, don't, you, you, don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to be crazy. I can do this. I can act like a king. I can act like a king. I can act like a king. And Psalm 39 is a lesson in spiritual maturity 101. Like some of you may be new Christians. Maybe some of you are convenient Christians and you're frustrated. What Psalm 39 unpacks, if I'm going to live in my calling if I'm going to walk in the anointing that God has for me, this is spiritual maturity 101. Teenagers, this is for you. Starting a freshman in high school this year, this is for you. Going to be in junior high this year, going to be a senior, maybe going to college. This is for you. This is spiritual maturity 101. Let's get these things right. Here's the first thing that David says. My calling should change how I speak. My calling should change how I talk. Who I am now means I have to live up to a calling. Yesterday I was watching sheep. Today I'm carrying God's calling on my life, and that means something. Parents, you know this. You got to be careful what you say. Because your child will come up with you, and they will have this great, crazy idea, and it's a big, awesome idea, and they're like, be dad. It was so awesome if we could have like 37 of my friends and we could have a weekend and like we could play this and buy that and do all this. And, and as parents, we, we say this, we go, oh, that's a good idea. You said that's a good idea. Junior heard, yep, you can do it. You know what I'm saying? Parents, you know what I'm talking about? Like maybe means yes to them. Hey, dad, can I go to maybe? Yes. That's why the Bible says let your yes be yes and your no be no. It's because you have kids, right? We have to be careful what we say. Our words carry meaning. David has just been named the next king, and he begins this song. Man, i got to watch my mouth, because I've been out in the sheep pasture, and they don't say nice words out there. They don't call that doo-doo. <laughs> if I'm going to be king, i got to live like it. If I'm going to be king, i gotta, I got to talk like it. And, and that doesn't mean you have to learn how to speak with this British royal cheeky accent. You know what I'm saying? It's not, that, it's not that kind of thing. You've been given a position. And when God trusts you with his calling, when God trusts you with his anointing, you don't have the same luxury that the guys out in the sheep pen have. Everybody else can be negative. But when you have been called by God, there is an expectation for you to walk and talk in faith. Everybody else can jump right into juicy gossip. But when you've been anointed and called by God, I've got to rise above to another level. I've got to come up to the level of my calling. I can't do what everybody else does. The other shepherds have a freedom to speak their mind, to offer their offense, to spew their opinion, to say whatever and laugh at whatever coarse, crude thing they want to laugh at. But when you are carrying the calling of God on your life, my calling changes how I speak. Verse 1, I said to myself, I'm going to watch what I do and I'm not going to sin in what I say. I will hold my tongue when sooners are around me. I mean, when the ungodly are around me. I'm just going to tell you, this is 
and may always be one of the hardest things you ever face on your spiritual journey. This is what James says about holding your tongue. James chapter three, verse two, indeed, we all make many mistakes. If you could just control your tongue, dude, you'd be perfect. Like your mouth dictates your destiny. It just, there's so much power in the words that we say. Like, if you can tame your tongue, shoot, the rest of it's going to be easy. If you can bite your lip and not share juicy gossip, man, you're going to have it made. It's the hardest thing, Christian, that we will face is getting a handle on this flapper that's between the ears. At this point, David is a young man, and he don't have a lot of enemies. But when he says, when the ungodly around me, he's talking about his brothers. Because they made fun of him at the dinner table. Because they used to beat him up when he couldn't do anything about it. Like, like oh, and he, so he's here. And like Samuel's pouring anointing oil on him. And Jesse's going, what? And Shemiah's over there and he's like. <laughs> and David's watching all this go on and it's just building and it's stirring. And when David's brothers started their condescending, smirky, old brother ways, he just wanted to blow them up. I just wanted to remind you, it was my head that got the oil, and your head got nada. But that wouldn't be very becoming of a called king, now would it? My calling changes how I speak. Verse 1 again. I said to myself, I'll watch what I do, and I'll not sin in what I say. I will hold my tongue when the ungodly are around me, but as I stood there in silence... Not even speaking of good things. Dad said, don't talk. Not, not, I'm just, I didn't even talk of the good things. But the turmoil within me grew worse. The more I thought about it, the madder, the hotter I got. Igniting a fire of words and he's going. My calling changes how I act. It changes what I say. It changes how I speak. But it's more than that. My calling changes how I act. I act, brothers and sisters, we have been called. Yesterday, you were in the sheep pasture. Out there, you can let your emotions get the best of me. Get it, there, you stupid friend. You know, you don't want to kick the males because they kick back. But. but today, the prophet poured oil on my head and something has shifted in my life. And my calling requires I change how I act. Verse 2. But as I stood there in silence, not even speaking good things, the turmoil, he's painting an emotional picture. The more I thought about it, the angrier I got. He's painting this picture of his emotions. I hear my brothers making fun of me. I hear people going, well, let's see how this works now. I hear people gossiping about me. The turmoil grew worse inside of me. And I wanted to go off like a Tasmanian bottle rocket. The more I thought about it, the hotter I got. But when we carry the high calling of God, when you've been sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit, when you really believe greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, I cannot let my emotions dictate my every move. Can't. I can have emotions. Emotions are good. Emotions are what make movies good. Emotions are what make wedding days special. Emotions are what inspire me to push and drive and push. I can have emotions, but my emotions can't have me. I'm so mad I could spit fire. But as an anointed child of God, I do not have that luxury anymore because I have been called. Even Jesus, he saw injustice. He saw people misusing the house of God. And the Bible tells us that he cleared the temple twice. But in his emotions, he was angry and did not sin. You can have emotions. Your emotions just shouldn't have you. My calling changes how I act, so I'm not going to act out of anger anymore. My calling changes how I act, so I'm not going to act out of depression. I'm not going to let fear make me inactive in what I'm going to do. God has called me, he's equipped me with every good work, and I'm not going to derail my destiny because I can't get a hold of my temper. I'm not gonna let fear keep me from my future. My calling changes the way that I act. So I notice a turning point in David's writing, like he's building this, like there's good things going on, I didn't talk about that, dad told me to be quiet, and so I'm silent, I'm silent, I'm sitting there, and I'm, and I'm sitting there, and, 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 and then all of a sudden, it just lighted this fire on the inside of me, and I'm gonna let those sons of Baptist preachers have it. Sorry, <laughs> made my wife really nervous right there. 
Verse 2. As his anger and his turmoil rose, I stood there in silence, not even speaking. The turmoil grew within me. The more I thought about it, the hotter I got, igniting a fire of words, colon. This is the words that he spewed all over everybody. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered and how fleeting my life is. You've made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. Selah. That's it. That's the fire of words. No strike them. No kill them. May the flies of a thousand camels fly up your nose. That, that, that would, like David's building this emotional case. And, you know, I thought when I was reading this, he was going to teach us some naughty words in Hebrew. You know what I'm saying? Like, as his emotions raged, as his frustration grew, he was tempted to say the wrong thing. He was tempted to act out of motion. But David, instead, he turns to prayer. And so here's the, here's the turning point. The first two things David tried to do on his own. He said, I'm going to be careful in what I say. I'm going to change how I act. Let me tell you something I've discovered. That if I want something to change and to last, I ain't able. It really has to be the spirit of the living God falling fresh on my life. It really has to be greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. I cannot change anything. I can try and I can try and guess what? About two and a half weeks, I get frustrated, give up and quit. But it's when I tap into the power of the Holy Spirit that he has provided for you and I. And when I let that spirit swell up and rise on me and inspire me and I keep myself grounded in prayer and I keep myself grounded in worship and I keep myself grounded in his presence, God's power brings the change that I need in my life. And notice his prayer. His prayer was not God keep me from cussing, his prayer was not, God, keep me from hitting. His prayer was, God, remind me of my calling. Man, that's so good. My calling changes how I live. It changes how I talk. It changes how I act. But it also changes how I live. My life is so short, I cannot waste a single day worrying about what my older brother thinks. I can't change the way they think anyway. My time is so fleeting on this earth, I don't have time to waste energy on what critics think of me. They're critics. That's what they do for a profession. And even if I did it the way they wanted me to do it, they wouldn't be happy with that either. Life is so short, you do not have the energy to waste it on everybody that's offended at you about every little thing. Life is so short, you cannot waste your life letting your emotions get caught up in every little bitty thing that's going on out there. Instead of praying about his problems, David started praying for his purpose. Because your purpose will trump your problems every time. I can't be a great king if I have a temper problem. I can be a king. I just won't be a great king. I can't be an awesome king if I can't control my mouth. I can be a king, but I won't be an awesome king. I can't lead people if I can't lead my own emotions. God, remind me my purpose is bigger than my problems. And my problems actually serve a purpose in my life. See, that, that, that leans into the convenient Christianity. God, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do just enough that when I hit a problem, I, I, like we're still good, right? Like your grace is cool. And what God wants to say is, listen, that problem you're going through, that boss, that boss is serving a purpose in your life. That job where you feel dead in, frustrated, God's saying that's serving a purpose. It's serving his purpose in your life. Romans 8, 28 says all things, not just some things, not just the things we like, just the things that are easy, but all things work together for your good. And the things that we wish we could change, I wish I could change my older brothers and stop making fun of me and smirking when I talk about bears and lions and tigers, oh my. And God's saying, David, your problems are serving my purpose in your life. 
Whatever you're going through today, it's serving a purpose in your life. Your depression, oh God, that you would heal it. Oh God, today, that you would fix it. Lord, you're able, you can. Your Holy Spirit can come down and like somebody can lay hands on me and I could walk out of here miraculously healed and never be depressed again. But God's also saying this depression is teaching you dependence upon me. It's serving a purpose in your life. Your anger, you blow up like a Tasmanian devil, rip bottle rocket, blah, 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 blah. God wants to use it to serve a purpose in your life. He's using it to grow you and mature you and help you get stronger. David's brother served a purpose. David's sheep pen served a purpose. David's problem served a purpose in his life. And some of you in here, your anger is what's keeping you from the next level. Your emotions are what's keeping you from stepping into the high calling that God has for you because you're focused on the wrong thing. You're focused on somebody else who you think, and you've come up with this opinion, that that person ought to live their life to make you happy. And you're focused on the wrong thing. David said, God, help me to focus on my purpose, not the problems going on around me. My life is too short to get caught up in stuff that it don't matter. Some of you in here, your depression is keeping you from going to the next level because you're focused on the wrong things. You don't understand. You're right, I don't, but he does. And he's asking you to walk in total dependence with him. Some of you, fear has locked you into a prison. And it's keeping you from taking the next step. And David said, God, keep my days before me. Life is too short for me to let fear rob me of my future. I've got too much to do, y'all. You've got too much to do, for you have been called. God has a purpose, a plan, and a destiny for you. And he wants you to watch and change how you talk. He wants you to change how you act. But he also wants you to live every day focused solely on the purpose that he has for you. Amen? God, remind me. God, remind me. God, remind me of my purpose. Every head bowed, every eye closed, you're here today. You're like, I needed this. I needed this. I've let my emotions, I've let my anger, I've let my problems get too much of me. I've needed this. Man, right here in this moment, I believe that we're just going to shift and we're going to refocus. Father God, right now we come into this place, Lord, and we begin to believe that you can heal everything that's broken. But Lord, until you do heal it, we believe it's going to serve a purpose in our life. Father, in this moment, I believe that you can wipe out all depression. You can wipe out all anxiety. God, that you would do that. But I also believe in this moment, Lord, help me to focus on my purpose. Help me to focus on you. Help me to focus on the right things so that I won't be focused on the wrong things. God, it's in this moment that we begin to cry out to you. God, it's in this moment I'm asking you to do what only you can do. God, we release it to you today. Would you bring healing focus today? God, we worship you. Come on, church. You made a way. Thanks for watching this sermon on the Hillspring YouTube page. If you enjoyed it, take just a second, hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss a single video. For more information about Hillspring, visit our website at hillspring.tv for times and location. We hope your faith was lifted and your life has been inspired with this message. Thanks again for watching.